Hello and welcome to episode 78 of the Chills of Will podcast. It is a pleasure to be joined by Matt Ortile. Matt Ortile is the author of the essay collection, The Groom Will Keep His Name, which is a collection about sex, power, and the myths of American society. See, you want to read it already, don't you? BuzzFeed called the book, quote, witty and insightful. Oprah, I think you may have heard of her, said it's one of many queer books that are, quote, changing the literary landscape in 2020. I'd say 2021 as well. Matt is also the managing editor of Catapult Magazine and a contributing writer at Condé Nast Traveler. Previously, he was the founding editor of BuzzFeed Philippines. He's a McDowell Fellow, McDowell Fellow and has written for Vogue, Self, Out, Into, and BuzzFeed News, among others. He's a graduate of Vassar College, which means he now lives in Brooklyn. Welcome, Matt. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Peter? Pretty good, thanks. And I, I, I don't usually have so many corny jokes as I did in that first little bio. <laughs> no <laughs> but, worries. But it called for it. Um, when, in the book, this is a very insignificant question compared to the larger themes we're talking about. But in the book, when you talk about Vassar, your alma mater, you reference The Simpsons. And I, mm. remember, and I remember Lisa referencing Vassar College. Right. And I think Homer said, no more you're Vassar, Vassar bashing. Is that the episode you're talking about? Or am I, or am I too um, much in the, in the minutiae here? I, all I really remember is that she has this dream where like the seven sister schools personified yes, yes. Um, are talking to her um, about something. And she's like applying to college, I think is the episode. But okay. yeah. Okay, nicely done. Yes, I remember just the quick <laughs> one, but you're right. That was, uh, that was more meaningful for sure. Was awesome. <laughs> Again, thanks so much for joining me. I know you're, uh, you know, we're all, we're all on the Labor Day holiday. So it's, it's awesome to have yeah. you. Yeah. Just yeah, no worries. Book. Just finished the book today. Um, and, you know, great book, important book. And uh, obviously, it's a collection of essays. So, um, you know, there are unifying themes, which we'll talk about, but it does have, you know, I want to say maybe nine or 10 separate essays. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10. So, so before there was the groom will keep his name, there was the young Matt. Born in the Philippines, <laughs> born, in, born in Manila, am I correct? Or in the metro area? That's right. I was born in Manila. Okay. Um, and would that be, you know, you talk about obviously all the languages of the Philippines, um, including Tagalog, which is maybe the best known for non-Filipinos, but what is, what mm -hmm. was your relationship to language? I know you, you, you spoke English, learned English in schools and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. What was your relationship just with the written word, I guess, and, and language in general? Oh, sure. Um, well, I think one of the long running jokes in my family is that I was always better at English than I was in Filipino in Tagalog <laughs> specifically. Um, I grew up with both. Um, but I think with, I think in my generation and among a certain class set, mm -hmm. uh, you know, English was 10, ten as a kid, you kind of tend to prefer English, if anything, because it just makes you seem cooler, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, you know, literally, it is more common to speak in Tagalog, in Filipino, and, and, you know, that's a lot of already, you know, you can flag that as some internalized colonialism mm. already, mm. Um, even, at, you know, at, a, at an age where you're trying to soak up as much language as you can, and, um, but I was also surrounded by another dialect, uh, fi another Filipino language, actually, mm. called, um, uh, colloquially, Ilongo, um, more formally, you might call it Hiligaynon, um, which was spoken by my nannies and my mother, um, mm -hmm. but I can only understand it and hear it, but I can very, I don't speak it very well, um, but it was another one of those kind of things where, oh, okay, here's a language as a tool of communication and, and connection, and later on when I got to college and I was kind of on the fence about my whole identity as being, you know, a brown American, a Filipino person in America, and uh, that language, that tertiary language that I picked up from my, uh, from my mother and my nannies was actually something that I used to connect with one of my very close Filipino friends on campus because that was the only Filipino language that she spoke. Wow. And she could only, you know, hear and understand Tagalog but couldn't really speak it kind of um, directly or kind of really fluently. So it was one of those interesting things like, oh, and around really at college age is when I started to really think about language as this thing that is about communication and connection and community. And so now actually I'm traveling, I'm on vacation this week. And so I'm really very aware of 
how language can, you know, give you a leg up in certain situations versus mm -hmm. really hinder or impede your experience of a place of a people. Sure. Um, but yeah. Oh, very interesting. What were you reading? As a kid? As a kid. I mean, what, I guess, what, yeah. what, what weren't you reading? I mean, I, was, I know it's a big question and a big gap of time, a big space of time. But... Sure. <laughs> the nutshell would be that, you know, I think uh, I was reading my parents, my mom gave me like chicken soup, oh, yeah. you know, the chicken soup books. Um, that was something she gave me when we first came to the States. But I think one of my big transition objects, you know, something that was a part of my experience in both the Philippines and in the U.S., were obviously the Harry Potter books and very much part of that, that generation. When I moved, I actually distinctly remember the fifth book was the first book that I got in the States, whereas okay. before I would have them shipped over to me by my grandparents. Mm. Um, the third and the fourth book came from San Francisco um in their big balik bayan box which is like this you know a, literally just a big crate with all kinds of stateside imports that family oh, members wow. in, in you know filipino americans would send their family members back home in the philippines so i was on the receiving end of it and my grandparents would send me you know um i think nesquik you know <laughs> oval teen um and i distinctly remember my fourth harry potter book was covered in kind of like a syrupy kind of medicine you know like one of those kind of daily multivitamins that you give to a kid so that they can grow taller or something <laughs> um but yeah so you know i was a harry potter kid chicken soup was kind of an introduction to american literature i guess for me because sure. you might consider harry potter british literature um but then I, I had a very early for whatever reason i was drawn very early on to nonfiction, particularly david sedaris augustine burroughs yeah. um and reading memoir, particularly queer memoir, um, kind of helped me see myself in a way uh, on paper that I hadn't before. Even though these were, you know, white men, they they were queer. And uh, in my teenage years, I was very much I had come out very early on at about thirteen, and I was trying to find my way through it to navigate mm -hmm. you know what it means to come into your queerness and those are some books that really helped me figure it out and you know one thing led to another and just kind of nonfiction became my kind of preferred writing mode um and so it felt pretty organic that the first book that i've written is um uh, essays and memoir or memoir in essays yeah right tell me a little bit about this connection with david sedaris i mean i, I know some of his work I don't know if it's now just that he's older. I think he's probably in the seventies. He, he seems to me like, like an incredibly benevolent, you know, like makes fun of himself, mm. you know, like fun grandpa type. Was that, <laughs> was, was that what you read into? Was it, was it simply the fact that he was another queer voice? Was it him in particular was all the above? What was it that drew you to him? The humor, definitely the kind of self-deprecating, right. right? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I re very recently read something of his in the New Yorker um, and he was talking about his late father. So again, he's writing about his family, which he's always done. And you kind of, it's fascinating to see like, if you fall, if you're a big kind of Sedaris head, you, every time he talks about his family, you just know everybody's shorthand, you know, like Amy uh... is Amy Sedaris, you know, it's never like actress and comedian, <laughs> Amy Sedaris. It's just Amy, my sister. Sure. Um, but you kind of, and the characters of his mother, who is his, his now late mother and now his late father, um, who I think survived the, the mother by at least 15 or 20 years. Uh -huh. and, but you kind of see this whole progression of that family. And I think, you know, among the, beside the self-deprecating humor and the kind of nonchalance with which he mm. incorporates his queer identity, his gay identity, his, mm -hmm. his partner, husband, Hugh, um, uh, he really wrote about um, navigating the world of his family and the expectations and the challenges and, you know, his own stumbles through life with and without his family. Mm -hmm. I thought that was something actually now in hindsight, I can see that I really connected with before, you know, if you asked me as a teenager, I would say it was because, you know, we were both gay men, but I think I saw even then this real well uh, that he draws from that is his family. And 
I think now in kind of recent developments in my family life, uh, something that I'm kind of seeing, oh, it's going to be a big part of my life, obviously, but also definitely my writing life. Sure. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, you, of course. You, talk, you talk about Sedaris and getting to know his family and reading over the years. I, I just mm. think, I mean, I think I literally just heard one episode of him on with, with Terry Gross. Mm. And it was mainly about his father. And I'm, and I'm sorry to hear this father passed away. I mean, it's yeah, probably within the last year or two, but, but yeah, I definitely yeah. felt a connection to him and his father just by listening to, you know, 40 minutes mm-hmm. of, the, of the radio. So that makes sense. Yeah. I think I know the answer and it's probably two letters um, based on what I've read in the groom will keep his name, but I wonder about, about representation. Did, mm. did, did you feel like, you know, everything that makes you up, not just your queer identity, but everything about you, did you feel like you were reading about people like you? Were you, did you feel represented in what you read as a kid? Um, uh, the first instinct answer is no. Um, you know, the kind of the specificity that you might bring up, say a queer Filipino man, you know, immigrant. Uh, I didn't really see that immediately. Um, so no, not definitely not in reading. I think there was a little bit more leeway in television and film. Okay. Um, the way that you might read many Asian characters as queer or just effeminate as how they're written as a stereotype. Um, or like I would see a lot more gay characters, but they tend to be white, uh, especially growing up in the 90s and early aughts. Hmm. Um, so I, it was interesting. I kind of have to take bits and pieces of different characters in popular hmm. texts and kind of try and synthesize something that looked like me in my own imagination. And there was never kind of an easy, like obviously, yes, you know, this person only kind of in the last five years or so, could I say, yes, I have seen a queer Filipino character on television. Um, And I think more in, uh, in literature, I see a lot more queer Filipino writers, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, working in both fiction and nonfiction. Um, Yeah. So early on, no, but these days I would say yes, a little bit more. Um, But I've also put a little less weight on kind of representation politics, just Mm because, you know, there's, it has its limits, you know, Mm. uh, there's, you know, conversations about that, of course. Um, But yeah, so to answer your question, no, at first. (laughs) The, um, you know, the, the, the aphorism or the adage is something to the effect of read about, if you want to know about one man, read nonfiction. If you want to read about, if you want to know about all men, read fiction. I want, <laughs> right. So I wonder if um, there, there was fiction there, there is currently fiction that where you feel represented. And again, I keep coming, I, you said, you know, representation is not everything. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'm quoting you right there, but I guess just the <laughs> idea of what fiction have you read maybe that, that you've really felt um, whether it represented you or not, that, that has really given you chills at will to kind of, to quote the uh, name of the podcast that, you know, they're really thrilling, really, man, this is so good. And sorry, that was a long, yeah, question. I mean, and I'm sorry. That no, was a I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you though. I, I think these days, the kind of the thrill that I get of recognition, let's say, yes. it's less about seeing myself in something else. Mm-hmm. Um, seeing like, oh, that is my exact same experience or, uh, oh my God, that's a mirror image of me. I, I, I kind right. of don't see that as much. Um, and I'm not terribly widely read. Um, I tend to have, a, because I read for a living, you know, working at a magazine where I read other people's work constantly. People are always asking me, what are you reading for fun? It's like, I don't, mm-hmm. I read for work. So sure. I don't wanna, when I try to relax or have fun, I try to not look at words. Sure. Um, but, but the thing of recognition, I think is something that I, I would say, I feel is, I wouldn't say more important, but I respond to a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So all of that to say, I would say in fiction, one particular book that comes to mind is this book by a Filipina author named Mia Alvar. Okay. Mia, M-I-A, Alvar, A-L-V-A-R. Um, a Filipina immigrant based in America. And she's a little bit of a third culture kid as well, having grown up in, born in the Philippines, I believe, and raised in Bahrain in the Middle East, mm. um, and then grew up 
as well in the US, I believe in New York and definitely attended school in New York. And so her book, it's a collection of short stories called In the Country. And so these short stories draw from a very wide kind of Filipino diaspora, you know, mm. Filipinos in the Philippines, Filipinos in the Middle East, Filipinos in the US, Filipinos throughout time. Mm. And it was really cool to see people who looked like my community, certainly. And I could see some kind of traits in the characters that I possessed or traits in characters or descriptions of characters that seem to fit with my aunts and uncles or sure. my grandparents. And that I think was pretty powerful for me because Mia was writing about uh, a collective, a, a diaspora, a community that, and, and a community with its own strengths and weaknesses, its own faults and um, successes um, that felt very true mm -hmm. to, um, to the communities and spaces, Filipino spaces that I've experienced. And I think that's, there's something really cool in that because I think one of the failings of representation politics is that very often we expect one particular character in say a film to represent multiple kinds of, you know, um, people who resemble that character. Um, thinking right now about, you know, it's like September 2021, Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings just came out, Legend of the Ten Rings just came out. I'm not actually even sure what the right, the right title is, but Shang-Chi came out. Um, and, you know, there's kind of like this cool, oh, it's the first like Asian led, Asian majority cast in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And, you know, but it's still, I'm hearing some people who really, really love it. So the people who are like, Meh, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if you want a real Asian film, watch um, okay. House, of Flying House of Flying Daggers, which is like, that's a completely different thing. And so very people, uh, very many people have, very many, a lot of people <laughs> um, have different kinds of expectations. Um, for one kind of character or one kind of piece of art. And it's inevitably going to disappoint some people, mm -hmm. make some people really proud. And so that's, I feel like, can be the risk that you take when, you know, and every kind of piece of art takes risks, but yeah. that is the kind of thing that you run the risk of when you are trying to represent one character or a small yeah. set of characters. What I think that this book by Mia Alvar is great at, and even though, you know, not every kind of Filipino is represented in its pages, it doesn't try to present only one kind of positive image of a mm -hmm. Filipino person or of a Filipino family or of, a, of the Philippine country. Um, if anything, she, I mean, I remember profiling her actually for BuzzFeed Philippines ages ago. And one of the things that she said was, I wanted to present, and I'm paraphrasing her, one of the things I wanted to do was to just show Filipinos behaving their worst. Hmm. Um, because one of the things that Filipinos are kind of have hangups over is always being represented positively. Um, always presenting that kind of uh, famed Filipino hospitality or that kind of positive attitude or the, the stereotype of being hardworking. You know, one of our biggest exports in the Philippine, from the Philippines is humans, mm -hmm. nurses, you know, seafarers, people working on cruise ships and um, all of that to say, you know, it was cool to see a book that didn't try to be one thing, to be one good thing. It wanted to just present humans mm -hmm. in with multiple dimensions and facets. So I thought that was very cool. Oh, thank you for sharing that. A good name to look yeah. up, a good name to look up and to read. One, yeah. one, one more question to kind of about the about language and then we'll get more into the, the specifics of your writing. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, you know, Tagalog as a language, if there, if there are parts of its structure, the way it's spoken, the way it's written that have kind of been, that have, been, have informed your English, have informed your writing overall. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, that's a great question because, so the thing about it is that, again, it wasn't my best subject at school. So the, the way that mm -hmm. you're, that I am now able, especially as an editor, you know, able to sort of identify, okay, subject versus object, you know, like, uh, dependent clause versus independent clause, you know, 
like those kinds of parts of language, I'm kind of able to see the mechanics in English a little bit better now. Okay. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope my writers think so. <laughs> but um, speaking Tagalog is for me kind of innate. It's more instinctual. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not quite as able to see the parts that make up the whole. Sure. Um, so in the thinking about a question where am I able to inform my writing in English by how I speak in Tagalog, I would, I mean, I would want my answer to be, I, yes, I do, but that's more of an aspirational thing. Cause I could, mm. cause at, as it stands, I don't, mm -hmm. but it's really cool. And I, cause I'm thinking about it like right now, I can't even, I mean, this would be a whole other kind of session, but you mm -hmm. know, I, I don't necessarily know how to kind of, take my influences and in how I speak Tagalog versus um, how I might write in English. So no, unfortunately, but it would be a cool exercise to try and figure some kind of connections out or try some kind of exercise about this is how you might construct a sentence in Tagalog or this is how you might try to express the same emotion. Right. I guess so kind of evolving the question too, it's like, you know, the, it's interesting the, because the book is so America focused, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel as if like, I remember my um, my team was trying to explore um, translation opportunities into Tagalog, and it doesn't quite happen. I mean, broadly across books, um, because the English literacy rate in the Philippines is pretty high, and a lot of people do read books in English. Mm -hmm. um, and so there wouldn't really have been a need. Um, I would have loved those translation fees, but, you know, it, it <laughs> wasn't, um, it's not really in the cards. So... But it would be a cool exercise to try and translate like maybe one essay into Tagalog. Mm -hmm. I think my hu I, I would have a different sense of humor, I think, in Tagalog. And I, right. I think a lot of the jokes would be lost uh -huh. just because so much of it is like play on like English, on American culture and the English language. And um, yeah, so okay. the short answer to the question is no. <laughs> no. My Tagalog does not influence my English all that much. But I appreciate that, though, especially the last part, yeah. the uh, kind of, it was kind of like a tongue-in-cheek humor, is that how you'd describe it, or? Uh, the, my English humor, like or the, my? Like, the, like in Tagalog, you talked about kind of like, kind of like poking fun almost at, at American ways. English. Um, not quite. I mean, I just literally what I mean is that in Tagalog, I have, a, my jokes would be different, because you, the way that. Okay. Yeah, okay. and I think. And I think Filipino uh, Filipino humor and a particular kind of Filipino humor is also very different. Mm -hmm. um, there's kind of different comedic rules or, you know, whatever you might call it. Sure. Um, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. I appreciate that. You, um, sure. you are a young and successful writer and I'll stress, I'll stress young, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so you know, where were, where were those eureka moments or was there one eureka moment or, you know, on the way to like saying like, Hey, I can, I can do this. I can get paid for writing. I can, people are going to want to read what I write. Did, where, where did those come up? I would say, I think maybe one that one essay uh, that I published at Buzzfeed in mm. 2014 it was about um, Roland Bart and his book, A Lover's Discourse. And it was about a breakup that I had at the time. And so I was trying to combine this kind of very academic, I had just graduated faster. So I still very like trying to aspire to some kind of literary sensibility um, mm -hmm. that I have and haven't given up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and is it kind of combining that very intellectual kind of reading of a relationship which is one might say is a little bit more emotional mm -hmm. base you know kind of common but also uh romantic and you know people have a lot of people have written about breakups before and I tried to do something a little bit uh different by tying it to this particular academics text and mm -hmm. it seemed to really hit I remember my editors were relatively surprised at how popular it was um uh, when it was published. And I think that was one of those kind of moments where it clicked, where it was like, oh, I can talk about relationships in a, in a smart way. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of my 
if not necessarily the North Star, it was one of the sort of constellations that I tried to keep in my sky while I was navigating the ocean mm-hmm. of trying to publish a book. And okay. I, that was one of the things where I was like, no, this works. People like stuff like this. People inherently understand that the ways that we interpret relationships, the ways that we interpret sex, the ways that we interpret sexuality, um, there's something there that you know people pull from and can extrapolate into like bigger things in their lives or other things in their lives mm-hmm. um, and tr- can make meaning out of that. And so for me, the more that I dug deep into writing about relationships, I realized, oh, I'm actually also writing about race and immigration mm-hmm. and desire and power. Um, and so kind of leaning on those foundations really helped me, you know, stay strong while I was writing the book, whenever, you know, you had those moments where you're like, I can't do this, you know, who, who am I kidding? Those kinds mm. of moments. And I just had to think about some of those kinds of, you know, as you say, Eureka moments and, and kind of keep the faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know this for sure. I'm my educated guess is that, you know, like a Buzzfeed would have very advanced metrics, for example, like, you know, about, about who's reading that. I mean, did you get, yeah. was that somewhere it's, it's skewed very young? Like, I don't know, the 18 to 30. Oh, or hard age to wise. I don't remember if yeah. we had that data at the time. Cause I don't remember it, period. But um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, what I could see were essentially comments, right? So comments on the post um, shares on Twitter or shares on Facebook and it was cool to see a lot of people both in America and in the Philippines reading it. Mm-hmm. Um, even though the essay did itself didn't talk about being Filipino, but knowing that I had was starting to develop a small kind of following on Twitter that also had Filipinos on it, it was cool to see them really engage with it too. Um, and also it was really cool to see people. I, I distinctly remember one comment that went along the lines of, you know, this person, she was saying that she's a Latina, older woman. I think she mentioned she was a mother or something. But like the point was that she was someone who was very different from me is what she was saying. Mm -hmm. And she said, but I was still able to connect with your writing. And it was really cool. Another one of those reminders that, you know, you don't have to share everything with uh, a writer or a character to be able to connect with them as long as you know you find some kind of truth or power or in the thing that you're reading or watching um and it can speak to you that way even though the person that you're reading or watching on screen is no one like you mm-hmm. so that was really cool to see yeah what a beautiful compliment right yeah it was really oh, nice oh man um the groom will keep his name is over my shoulder here and i mean you're it's obviously nonfiction. It's about you. Um, yes. And it's not, you know, you, you, you talk about real people in your life. And mm. I, think, I think it's on your website where it says something like uh, some of your boyfriends were saying, you know, like, hey, don't write about me. <laughs> that effect, which, which I know is kind of like half joking because you do, but I think with some different names. And, but, I mean, you know, you yes. talk about family and, and you know, nothing, mm-hmm. to, nothing to rip on people. I mean, honest and honest about yourself. What is it like to, what is it like or what was it like to really just put yourself out there? Like, Ooh, this is my life. This is not just my life, my, you know, my mom and my family. Yeah. Um, so in terms of my life and kind of bearing it all quite literally in the, uh, in the book, um, for better or for worse, I kind of, I'm a little bit shameless and I don't <laughs> particularly, you know, I'm not embarrassed to talk about, you know, in the book, I talk about cruising in a gym steam room or like all literally all of these white boys that I've dated and you know kind of really dragging myself about like this kind of white desire that I've had to contend with all my life and you know all the good stuff and the bad stuff that I've experienced at at, the, at a certain point mm-hmm. and though I do keep some things for myself I knew that you know to kind of the, to, to write the kind of book that I wanted to write I wanted to share as much of myself as I can in a way that would, you know, I want it to to be an enjoyable read. I wanted to have the candor and the humor, but also I knew, though I don't think I would have been able to articulate it in this way before maybe the book was published or maybe even while I was, while I was writing it, I knew that I wanted to share as much as I could that felt safe 
at least, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's one thing a lot of nonfiction and memoir writers kind of contend with is, you know, how do I share as much of myself as possible without kind of diving into trauma porn sure. or kind of, you know, um, giving so much of myself up. Uh, but I, I wanted to do a good amount because I felt when I read writers who did that kind of work, in my reading experience, I trusted them more. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, it made me connect with them on a level, in a way that helped me really hear their arguments or really hear their stories and kind of try to, it, it helps me believe someone, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things, and to sort of turn it into a craft thing, um, when I work with my writers and when they write their personal essays at Catapult, sometimes you can feel when they're still holding a writer at arm's length, uh, uh, holding a reader at arm's length, when their writer is still kind of at a distance hmm. because either they're tiptoeing around something or they're beating around the bush or, you know, they might not even be ready to, to write about the thing that they're trying to write about. Um, and kind of half half the work that I do as an editor is like helping people figure out what they are, you know, safely able to write about. Um, and so, but all of that to say for me, I wanted to be able to do that because I didn't want anyone to feel like I was trying to, you know, keep anyone at an arm's length, at arm's length when I'm writing about such intimate things mm -hmm. as race and bodily experiences and sex and relationships and intimacy um so yeah i think that uh, i'm for better or for worse i am kind of shameless in that way but then thinking about my you know the men that appear in the book i wanted to make sure that identifying details were as scrubbed as possible um though i have had a few people it to various degrees and various reactions say oh so i read your book and Redacted, redacted, redacted. <laughs> redacted. Um, with regards to my family, particularly, so my mother is a very big character in the book, and now, you know, you know, I, she was such a big, and, and the book is dedicated to her, and she has been, has been, was. My mother passed away last summer, and you know, the time that we shared together was incredibly influential in my life, and she really shaped so much of who I am now and the kind of resources and privileges and kind of life literally that I have is because of her because of our immigration story so I wanted to flesh that relationship out as much as I could uh, but also do it in a way that she, where she felt comfortable because I think she had some concerns certainly about how other people in her life might read the book if they ever decided to um, and so one thing that I did do before publication was once the book was close to done, I shared not the whole book with her, but I shared every page where she and my stepfather were mentioned. And so it was, I said, here are the pages where you are, please, you know, fact check anything if you need. Um, but more importantly, if there is anything in these pages that I'm sharing with you that you feel uncomfortable with let's talk about it. I didn't give her veto power, but I wanted there to be no surprises. And I wanted there to be an opportunity for us to discuss getting at the truth of our relationship in a way that didn't jeopardize or make anyone in our lives extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very grateful that while she was alive, she was able to do that. And the kind of dramatic irony of it all is that she passed away um, you know, a few days after the book was published. And by the time it did come out, she was in a, in a state in her health where she couldn't read. And so um, I am grateful, certainly now after the fact that this book really, you know, it holds a version of my mother that I felt. And I, I would like to say that she felt was true and representative of at least our relationship as mother and son. So that's kind of the, you know, kind of the big challenges, one of the big challenges and one of the big beauties of writing memoir. 
uh, you know, your mother comes through with such a beautiful spirit in the book. Thank you. And uh, I, I, I hadn't known that she passed away, and I, I'm really, I'm so sorry to hear that. No, I, thank uh, you very much for your condolences. Yeah, I mean, just the just the gap in time between the publishing and, and just now, it's so sad to hear that. I know that she'd had her her health scares for sure, and uh, oh boy, yeah, I, I, I'm so yeah. sorry to hear that. Thank you. She thank does you, come Peter. across as a, as a beautiful spirit for sure. Thanks. I wonder. Um, I guess kind of a two part question then, like mm. the uh, yeah these these two parters. Uh oh, right. <laughs> um, you know the idea of like writing about things. I was going to ask you this before I found out the the horrible news about your mother. Even like um, mm. you know the mm -hmm. the idea of like oh writing about it is cathartic. Writing about it, you know, it cleanses. It it helps. You know, to it helps me to feel better about things and to identify them and such. So you know, is that true? Is that is that too cliche? Is that too corny? And then secondly, is that is even that changed by the fact that I'm sure you you know reread the book so many times. Mm. You know, it's almost like a you know somebody working at McDonald's and they, they're tired of burgers. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a terrible analogy. Your writing is much better than a McDonald's hamburger. But um, just this idea that you know you've gone through so many revisions and such. I wonder if some of the possible you know emotional you know hitting you emotionally could have maybe been lessened mm. by the fact that you read it so many times. Oh, well. So first of all, I will say I do love a, a McDonald's burger every now and then. So right? oh, so good. <laughs> so good. Um, I'm more of like a McChicken kind of guy, but I do love a burger sometimes. <laughs> um, so I'll get at the uh, second question first about um, does it kind of does the maybe the kind of impact of the thing mm -hmm. for me personally dull over time? It did for a little bit. I think I was sick of it at some point. I could not read it anymore. I think after my virtual book tour, because hmm. um, it was literally, you know, summer of 2020, it was a pretty rough oh, time right. for a lot of people. Um, I didn't want to look at it anymore. I didn't want to do any readings, but um, every now and then, you know, I would see like later in 2020 or anytime this year, if someone say, takes a photo of a page and puts another Instagram story and, and uh, tags me in it. Sometimes I'll read it. And I'm like, oh, wow, damn, that was good. I'm like, oh, right? he, he's a writer. <laughs> um, and sometimes I do feel like, oh, I would have done this a little bit differently. Um, but so I think if anything, I, it's helped me sometimes forget like, oh, I wrote that. Or like, I, I think uh -huh. so the, the kind of idea that like, oh, a different person wrote that, right? Um, it, I was writing that predominantly in 2019 and writing about a particular kind of a particular version of Matt Artile, you know, sure. it was also kind of in help in having to write the memoir, I had to sort of contend with, okay, there has to be an ending point for this Matt Artile, ending yeah. for now, right? Yeah. Um, not necessarily happily ever after, but like there had to be an arc for this character and they he had to land somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but then literally, you know, 2019, I finish it, um, I guess right top of 2020 because we were still editing in like January a little bit like you know proof pages um I'd, I've experienced so many new things since then the biggest of them being that my mother died and so my connection to my family has changed my connection I haven't been home to the Philippines because of the pandemic mm. um and so my connection to the Philippines has changed a lot like I was reading the chapter actually on the plane right over here um uh, I was uh, listening to my audio book. I couldn't fall asleep <laughs> on the plane. I was like, maybe I will bore myself. <laughs> so many levels um, right there. Wow. Yeah. So meta. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. And I was listening to myself talk about traveling to the Philippines and, you know, being really excited to be able to visit home more often. Mm. And literally I'm like, I'm here in, so I'm here in Vienna for the week. I went to Europe instead because okay. there would be no quarantine requirement versus like if I had gone home to the Philippines, I would have been uh, made to quarantine for 14 days. Um, like I can't do any of these things that I'm talking about anymore. So literally the book feels like a different person a little bit. Hmm. And the end of it kind of tries to set up a next chapter in Matt Artila's life, literally in another book in Matt Artila's life. Yeah. But that book feels really different from what I think now I'm experiencing. So the next memoir is going to feel really different from what I first expected. And, um, and please, sorry, Peter, remind me about the first half of the question. Yeah, I forget it too. No, I'm just kidding. It was um, <laughs> just, just, just the idea of like writing such a, a personal story and any sort of catharsis, you know, that came through that. Um, well, catharsis, not, 
I wouldn't say catharsis actually for me. I mean, now having mentioned everything about the second part of the question about looking at a very different kind of version of me in the past, I'm happy certainly mm-hmm. that I was able to preserve a kind of yeah. version of me or uh, definitely preserve my mother in a kind of way and a kind of vision mm-hmm. of her. I mean, that the mother in the book is not necessarily my mother in life exactly. Um, this is certainly how I saw her, but how my stepfather saw her mm-hmm. uh, for a fact is different. He didn't see her as a mother. Well, he saw her as like my mother, but he saw her first and foremost as his wife, right? Sure, sure. Um, so the way that people might read her in this book could be very different from how um, people understand her in life. But I'm also very grateful that like folks who never knew her in life get to experience her in this way and now get to hold her in their memories too, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, it never felt like writing the book wasn't like a huge release. It certainly felt like a big dream achieved, um, though it was foiled by the pandemic in a certain way. I am glad at least that it happened. Um, and so now it's actually kind of shifted my kind of my, how I work with my nonfiction, I think. I think these days I'm more interested in, and this is possibly how other nonfiction writers work already. Um, certainly for me, I think, you know, it was about processing and me- making meaning out of the things that I experienced in life, right? And connecting the dots, so to speak. Yeah. And that's still very much that. But now I think I'm so much more aware of how this is still a process of archival, of memory mm-hmm. keeping, of just like saving experiences in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I do talk about that kind of work in the book, literally about memory, sure. um, I think now more than ever, to use the phrase, um, because of just the loss that I've experienced with my mom's death, I'm just kind of more keenly aware of how every kind of story that I try to tell about myself, I'm not just doing it for others. I think I'm now Mm. really doing it for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Just like, remember this, remember this part, remember this Mm -hmm. part. Um, Yeah. On a lighter note, I think your, your, (laughs) I think, I think your epigraph is perfect. (laughs) Thank you very much. I have to thank Ari for it. Right. Yeah. Um, Just, I guess just to to wrap up, uh, you know, the, the bookends of the, the essay, the first one is Barong. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bar- Barong Tagalog. And the last is the, is the title story, right? Yes. And, you know, just the idea of, you know, identity is obviously such a huge part of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you, you reference yourself as, as a queer immigrant, brown, Filipina. I wonder, I wonder about the term queer. You know, I know it, there's mm-hmm. a history of queer and gay and, you know, is mm-hmm. that is, is that the idea of like reclaiming that that term that's been used so negatively for so many years? I, I wonder kind of how that how why you personally you know feel find meaning in that. Totally. So, from my understanding, and just from the kind of communities that I run in, uh, queer is used definitely as a reclamation of something that used to be you know something pejorative or per, um, yeah, um, uh, a slur essentially. Sure, yeah. um, and it, it feels like more of an umbrella term that allows more flexibility for the kind of spectrum of anything that's not heterosexual, essentially. Mm. Um, you know, beyond just L, G, B, and T, you know, lesbian, gay, bi, and transgender, you know, there's a lot of folks who uh, use the word queer to describe themselves because they are asexual or mm. demisexual or um, asexual, but hetero romantic or you know, uh, or homo romantic, but heterosexual. Um, like it, 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 there's this whole that I'm also learning about, um, but literally anything that kind of bucks the societal norm sure. um, or goes against that grain. And queer makes space for a lot of these things that are labeled and not things that are um, more common and not. Um, and so it, it's also kind of one of those it, it, again, it also has its failings, but I, from how I see it, 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 it offers someone uh, a, a, a name, a label, something mm-hmm. to hold on to while they're also still trying to figure out their own identities because you might be, you know, one thing one year. And as you continue to do this kind of 
personal work, all that good stuff. And you discover that you might actually be more of this or more Mm -hmm. of that. And so I think it, for me, I want to use it as something that was inclusive. Um, I do kind of bore in a boring, boring way, identify Mm -hmm. as just a cis gay man. And we have our own issues too, and our own privileges Mm -hmm. and, and harms and failings. So I mean, that might be something to talk about more um, another time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, there's obviously the idea, I mean, it's one thing to say like, oh, you know, decolonize your bookshelf and decolonize decolonize (laughs) this. You, you put very personal um, specifics on it. Just the idea of like, you talk about like some of your, you know, romantic and your romantic, you know, longings uh, for, for the white man and just, you know, so much about the, you know, that first story that I talk about is the, the Americana is basically yeah. like the suit maybe that we think of with the shirt and tie, right? Versus mm-hmm. the Filipino style clothing, especially pre-colonization, right? Colorful. Yes. And I was especially struck by the idea of like, you know, no shirt underneath, no pockets. You said, you said that maybe the story was, you know, perhaps not historic, you know, it's not known, maybe mythical, mm-hmm. this idea yeah. that you know, even pockets weren't allowed because of, you know, they're going to take something. And, yeah. uh, you know, Mestizo and Moreno and all of the, uh, one thing that really stood out to me as well was the idea of, yes, there have been Filipino politicians who would yeah. be considered to be Moreno, I guess, including D- Duterte, yeah. mm-hmm. but just like in America, right? Celebrities kind of run everything. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And that celebrity definitely. culture has it that, you know, the, you talk about, you know, bicultural or biracial Filipinos mm. and, and very, mm. very light skinned Filipinos, mestizos, who are mm. pretty much the ones who win the Miss, uh, you know, Philippines and, and all of that. So, yeah. You know, so the colonization, I mean, you just you, you just have a straight history lesson throughout the book that's great. And then to, you know, connect it to yourself is, is pretty incredible. Um, you know, and then just the idea of you talk about that to quote you, the Romans, because you use the Latin term. The Romans weaponized oblivion. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, you coming from the Philippines, I can say the same. Like, how much did we learn in school about the Bataan Death March? Yeah. I remember I, I remember I was in the library at Long Beach State University maybe four or five years ago, and I, I never mm-hmm. heard this in my life. I was reading about um, basically like waterboarding, you know, that was done mm-hmm. like in, in recent years, like started in the Philippines in the Filipino-American War. Yeah, you know, and just so I just wonder if that's a lot there to give you, but you maybe <laughs> talk about the idea of like just oblivion, not that necessarily the yeah. Filipinos have been seen as negative nor positive, and they have, but just like mm. the oblivion, like you talk about, just not talked about. Yeah, and, you know, just, kind of how that how that has hit you over the years. Totally, erasure. I think is something right. that um, a lot of people. It, it's one of those kinds of. Um, part of the kind of movement to decolonize ourselves, whether, you know, as, as non, you know, non-white people learning to, to reclaim their own heritages, their mm-hmm. cultures, and understanding how much white supremacy has impacted their lives and their own tastes and values. Um, so uh, I, I think that kind of erasure, oblivion, uh, is why there is such a, uh, 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 that's why there's a lot of people who want representation right. and who want themselves seen in uh, on screens, on platforms that are big, because that uh, means then that they are not only seen by themselves, but others see someone like them too. Mm-hmm. And so th- that's all powerful stuff. And it also has its own kinds of, it- it's very much that double-edged sword, as I mentioned earlier. But um uh that kind of erasure i think and was why i wanted to flesh out as much as i could sure. of these more researched historical parts of of the book um not only as a reminder to myself but to a lot of folks who are like me filipino and i think one of the things that is so kind of diabolical about how American empire works, present tense, is how it encourages the people who are subjugated by American empire to turn away from their own roots, to turn away mm-hmm. from their own cultural inheritances. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll say that 
what I've seen in a lot of, you know, first generation, second generation, you know, even third and fourth generation Filipinos um, now, people who are my contemporaries and younger than me, they're really trying to engage with their own, um, with their, you know, with their culture and with the, the Filipino language to bring it back to the top of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think there, you know, there's Tagalog classes um, coming up more and more. Um, but the kind of thing that's still a bummer for me as someone who is an immigrant, someone who grew up in the Philippines and moved to the States, even though I was, you know, a preteen, I, I still kind of for a long time have felt this um, half and half. Mm. Um, I was no, not born on American soil. And so I really have felt like an immigrant. I mean, now it's kind of shifting a little bit more. I've definitely spent more of my life in the States outside of the Philippines than I have in it. Um, but all of that to say, I still get very sad when I try to talk to someone who is Filipino or Filipino American and they don't know, you know, a lick of Tagalog because they didn't care to learn it when they were kids and refused it when their parents tried to teach them when they were younger or, or possibly even have no interest now. Mm -hmm. Um, or if they've always wanted to learn it, but they just didn't have the resources because their parents refused to teach them because they felt that if they learned the language and spoke with an accent, uh, spoke English with an accent, then they, the, the kids would have a harder time at school or would have a harder time in society. And so they really, you know, all of that internalized colonization not only comes from society, but also directly from, you know, families too sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so again, that sense of oblivion is so, painful I think very viscerally for a lot of folks and I am very privileged in a way to have to be an immigrant to have this mm -hmm. kind of closer connection to my homeland right. um, and I and that I still consider it my homeland it's mm -hmm. very much a part of who I am and mm -hmm. I definitely consider myself an American and but I also have being Filipino as part of myself and sometimes it's a bummer when you know don't be, some people for better or for worse don't claim Filipinoness as their own which you know that's their life their choices and, but I always have to wonder like you know if we lived in a different society if we lived in a better world would you be saying that and mm -hmm. it sometimes it's one of those hard thought exercises because we can't imagine that this is the world that we live in so we have to work under these systems and try to dismantle the ones that actively hurt us and oppress us the ones that actively make us forget the ones that actively throw us into oblivion yeah, one of the scenes that I'll definitely remember is well, a couple of those scenes where you're um, going for the, you're basically like reclaiming, like literally reclaiming your citizenship in the Philippines. Yeah. After after having to give it up for the, you know, and just that's obviously so metaphoric, you know. So it's like a <laughs> it's very convenient right? it's for like, me yeah. as a writer. Yeah. And, yeah. Then of and then of course, you know, talking about oblivion and lack of knowledge, you're. I forget if you were, I think in eighth grade, and your and your teacher was so surprised at how well you spoke English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, right and there's poor you know poor what 13 or 14 year old you having to like <laughs> do i educate this woman do i tell her the whole history of colonization <laughs> in the u.s or i just say yeah. thank, or just say thank you thank you next yeah um, yeah so. exactly <laughs> to, to end with um you talk about the mm. tagalog idea of kapwa am i pronouncing that correctly yeah um you know which you know could be seen in the negative this idea of like i think a lot of people know that the crab metaphor the as mm -hmm. they kind of come out of the bucket, kind of pulling each other down. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that does come through in the book that's 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 beautiful is is the communities that you have and the families that you have established, mm -hmm. right? The the text chains you have with friends, um, you know, some in the same community, some are not. Yeah, um, and just safety. Um, the different families. You talk, of course, about your mom being such a, a great person, and your stepfather seems like a great man. Um, you know, you talk about how great their their marriage was and, mm -hmm. and all the communities, you know, you come out to some of the weddings on the West Coast. And uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, while there's that idea of, you know, the crabs, there's also the idea of like togetherness and um, all these different communities, which is one of the 9000 great things about this book. Thank you very much. And I'm going to I'm going to promote it like heck in uh, in my little corner of the world. I'm going to, uh, you know, put it in my classroom library as I'm a high school teacher. 
And, Thank you, uh, Peter. I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. And I know it's just a matter of which. I know that I'll be using one of these essays, if not more, in some teaching. So it's just, I just got to figure out which one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Enjoy Maybe that. one of the more PG ones, PG-13. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. You get, but, you know, and, and obviously what you just talked about with oblivion and such is mm -hmm. reason number 2,843. I just made that number up that, you know, something like CRT needs to be taught. You know, critical race yeah. theory, and I mean, just yeah. How could how could it not? How could we not go back and talk about all these things that have about colonization and such? It's mm -hmm. you know, really appreciated reading your book. I know you're on vacation. I don't Thank know, I really you. Appreciate, appreciate your time. <laughs> Thank and you, I, Peter. I appreciate I the opportunity was just to be another, here. Hope this was just another event on your itinerary, right? That made your vacation great. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I actually do have a writing class tomorrow at around the same time, so I'm like up late. Like I, I have to check. It's like. 2 30 now so oh, i'm like God. yeah well get some yeah. sleep. get some sleep thank you I it was a pleasure it. talking to you thank you so much thanks peter take care right. take care bye bye bye, -bye.